I'm going to start with Nikki, who's going to talk to us about dehydration. Just for introduction, Nikki is a paediatric emergency medicine trainee still, yeah, from Malta, uh, adopted by Liverpool um, and working at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. Um, she's one of those foam, foam med nerds who um, I've been introduced to foam ed by the Don't Forget the Bubbles conference over the last few years and Nikki's one of the gurus. Um, she's got a real passion for education, social media and good journalism. And I'll hand over. Thank you very much. We're actually quite packed in here, aren't we? No pressure. <laughs> so this talk is actually called the High Yield Assessment of Dehydration in Children. Now we're all kind of pediatricians, emergency physicians, GPs. We do this every day, don't we? So I'm going to start with a bit of a warning, just in case there are any of you who are hoping that I was going to talk to you about the assessment of hydration in children from developing countries. I don't have the experience or the expertise to talk to you about that, unfortunately. So we're only going to talk to you about first world problems. When I was given this talk about six months ago now, I initially thought, yeah, of course, I do this every day. How hard could it be? So I'd like to do a show of hands because I thought that my assessment of hydration in children was actually pretty good. What, what about you? Who thinks that they're pretty awesome at assessing hydration in children? <laughs> we could do a poll, but there's no need. We can all do a show of hands. There's only one question here. Who thinks that they're, they're pretty OK? OK. All right. I feel more comfortable now, actually. Um, what about people who think that they could do better? Yeah, yeah. I feel a bit like that too. So we're going to go through it together. Um, but I'm a bit of a sucker for the evidence. And the evidence says that we are right. About 25 to 81% of the time. The <laughs> That's quite a lot. So we could roll a dice and, yeah, we'd probably be right or wrong and it would probably be fitting in the evidence either way. Um, but it wouldn't surprise you to know that if you're more experienced, you're more likely to think that the child is less dehydrated. Um, and if you're less experienced, you're more likely to overestimate the level of dehydration. So we're all, we all kind of play it safe. The point... If you're looking at the evidence, there are three things which have quite a good, um, there are three things that you look at, don't you, when you think about signs and symptoms of dehydration. You think about desiccation of tissue, which is things like um, sunken eyes, sunken fontanelle, compensatory mechanisms to maintain perfusion, so high respirate, high heart rate, or a combination of the two, something like prolonged CRT. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about scoring systems, and I'm not going to talk about individual signs, because if you look at the evidence behind the individual signs and the scoring systems, the evidence is quite poor. The studies are mainly on small populations. They're heterogeneous. And if you're looking at the systems in particular, they have little external validation. Most of us will remember when we went in, med in through med school, we had that big table where you knew if there were certain signs and symptoms, a child was moderately, mildly, or severely dehydrated, would it surprise you to know that that is just expert opinion? Um, so there's not much evidence behind what we do. However, if you are looking for a bit of evidence, these are the three signs you need to look out for. Capillary refill, skin turga, and respirate. Now these are really good to rule out the disease because their specificity lies at about 80%. But to rule in disease, their sensitivity is about 50%, so it's actually still quite poor. So here I am, six months on, thinking, what on earth am I going to tell these people? <laughs> There's very little evidence. I'm probably not as good as I thought I was. But I, do, I am inclined to think that some physicians are better than others. And because as Susie told you, 
I am very active online. I've created a network of people who I hold in very high regard as PEM physicians. So I ask them what they think. So they always tell you about spotting the sick child, don't they? And you learn it through experience. And that's not very good for a talk, so here we are. So we're going to go through it together. The problem, of course, with the evidence and with assessment of dehydration is the gold standard. The gold standard is based on pre-illness weight. Now, I don't know about you, but no one seems to come pre-illness pre weight to the emergency department. But what it does tell me is that if I'm seeing them on day one of their illness, I will weigh them just in case they come back on day three. The other thing that we know that this is a gold standard is because um, old studies base it on children's muscle biopsies which I found really surprising, but actually muscle biopsies demonstrate that loss of plasma volume is proportional to weight loss. Um, as you can imagine, pragmatically, and even in studies nowadays, we've not got the gold standard. So we've got to rely on good old history taking and examination, which is where we excel, really. So the first thing <coughs> that was highlighted when I had this discussion with people who I hold in high regard, was that actually in the first world, dehydration in children who are premorbidly healthy is extremely rare. So if you go in and you consider that, you're going to miss it. So just leave your bias at the door. Just forget it. The other thing that they spoke about was this look, this gestalt. And it was described to me very eloquently by someone who's very good at bird watching. She said, I was driving the other day and I looked up in the sky and I knew I was seeing a red kite. I don't know why I knew I was seeing a red kite, but I knew it was a red kite. There was this pattern recognition. It was something about the way they flew, the way they kind of soared above, their wingspan. It was just a dot in the sky, but I knew it was a red kite. There is just that look. And children who are dehydrated look different. Together, we're going to find out why. But I want you to keep in your knowledge bank those really well children that you see every day. We're lucky we see a lot of well children every day. The dehydrated child looks different to that. Look at their rest rate and look at their heart rate. If those are normal, then it's highly likely that the child is not dehydrated. OK. Then ask, ask about oral intake. In my personal experience, if a child is quavers positive, i.e., if they've eaten something, <laughs> even if mum says they have not drunk anything, but they've had something small to eat, probably not dehydrated. Also ask about urine output. Now, in a lot of studies and in a lot of guidance systems, people talk about decreased urine output being a red flag. And there's, there's some general agreement that, although it is a worrying symptom, it's not necessarily a red flag on its own. You have to look at the whole pattern. The next thing is about looking before you approach. And I like to look at the child in the waiting room or in the room before they see me, because somehow things change once they see a clinician or they know who I am and what I'm going to do. So if your child is drooling, active and playing, it's less likely that they're dehydrated. If they're withdrawn, they're quiet and a bit drowsy, I would probably prioritize those to be seen next. Next, I would look at them, especially look at their eyes. They somehow have this glazed look. They look they have, they're dark around the eyes, and if they cry, they're usually without tears. And then look at their skin. They somehow don't look as plump, and they generally sometimes look mottled. Now, there's something about mottling, which I, fo I found really surprising when I moved to the UK. I'm from a Mediterranean background, so my skin is a bit olive colored. When I moved to the UK, I was really surprised about how, ma how many times I saw mottling here. 
And it took me a while to like not leave the room and go, oh my God, that child's muscles, we need to calculate them out. And the nurse would be like, calm down, Nikki. Take it easy. Did you wrap them up first? I know, they're mottled, they're mottled. Wrap them up and go back. People with fairer skin tend to mottle quite easily. Yeah. So if there are no other worrying symptoms, then the general agreement here seems to be wrap them up, go back, and see if that goes away. Obviously, there are no other worrying symptoms. If they come from a Mediterranean background, they had different colored skin and they're mottled, don't wrap them up. They're mottled. <laughs> um, and then we spoke about there's a slight difference between children who we term isotonically dehydrated and those who have deranged salts and deranged glucose. So the ones who are just dehydrated but their sodium, their potassium and their glucose is normal somehow tend to look a bit plumpier. Those just need treating. So whether it is trial of fluids, if you're going to gain IV access or you're going to do NG, NG feeds, you don't need to investigate those necessarily. But if you are gaining IV access, then you should do bloods, and that's the nice guidance. The ones who have deranged salts or the deranged glucose somehow tend to look just that bit drier. They look that bit different. They could have neuroscience, so they could be a bit jittery. They tend to be a bit more drowsy. They just don't look as plump. With those, you definitely need to investigate them. And then, as with other things in pediatrics, there was some discourse about investigations. And there was a bit of a disagreement, and I'm just going to talk to you about it, and I'll let you have your own, come to your own conclusions about this. What about those that you're sitting on the fence with? You kind of have that hunch. A lot of pediatricians felt that investigation is definitely the exception, not the rule in pediatrics. But if you were going to investigate, your go-to investigation of choice at the bedside would probably be a blood gas. And if you're looking at the blood gas, look at the lactate. It's going to be squeezed and it's going to be high. So we thought that probably a uh, level of over four was more realistic. And if the base excess was deranged, kind of well over 10, kind of minus 15, then it's very likely that the child is dehydrated. Look at the pH. The good thing about blood gas is it gives you the salts and the glucose. So don't forget to look at those, because we sometimes do that. And then there was this discussion about, well, you've got this hunch, you've done the blood gas, and it's normal, so what do you do? And the answer to that is probably observe them, which is an investigation on its own, really, isn't it? A few precautions. Be especially careful with the very young, those under six months, and children with learning disabilities, because the signs are just softer, and you really have to rely on the parents. So with those, you tend to observe more. And then, as a final thought, remember that dehydration is actually a symptom and a sign of disease, and not the disease process itself. So if especially, because we know that in the first world dehydration is uncommon, then you really need to be asking yourself why. And realistically, it's very, very rare, if not unheard of, to be in a country like this and someone to die of dehydration. They're more likely to die because you've missed the DKA, because you've missed the severe sepsis. So if you're seeing someone who's dehydrated, keep asking yourself why. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Um, at the beginning, I didn't introduce Katie. This is Katie Knight. She's our Twitter moderator. Her um, Twitter handle's on the program. So... Um, Katie's been busy twittering away throughout that <laughs> talk, uh, so I'll go. I'll throw to Katie first. Um, we'll also take questions from the floor. We've just got the one handheld mic, which is the one I'm holding on to, so we'll need to pass it up and down. Um, so I'm just handing it to Katie first. Okay, she's looking at the moment. So, a question from the floor or comments? That's one 
uh, as a wave. Yeah. Hi, I'm from Alice Springs, Australia. We have a lot of kids with incredibly dark skin, which makes central cat refill incredibly difficult to assess, if not impossible. What do you think the reliability of a peripheral cat refill is compared? The evidence is really poor, isn't it? And I think, it's because it's really hard for me to say, I've only practiced in Malton here, and we don't have that population. So I think you'd be more of the expert than I would about the reliability of that, just from, your ex just from your experience. I don't know if anyone else has any ideas. Any other questions or comments from the floor? <coughs> um, just so, hi, I'm Lauren, I'm from hi. Melbourne, how are you? Yes, so just um, some things that I found quite useful in my clinical practice is on history, considering the duration of illness, we often have parents coming in the very short duration. Zero hours. Yes, and often say to them, well, you know, you go to bed at night and you don't drink anything for, you know, until yeah. the next morning. So if your child's been sick for eight hours and missed a little bit of fluid, that's probably okay. Yeah. But also I like to think about it in terms of, are they sick with an illness where they've just got decreased oral intake or have they got an illness where they've decreased Ill, um, intake plus losses? Yeah. And I think if you've got decreased intake plus losses, you're already putting a patient into mm -hmm. a more risky or sort of yeah. stratified risk group. Because if your child's not been drinking because they've got a bit of a viral illness for a day or so, and you might be okay, but if they're just you know, vomiting and got profuse diarrhea, then you need to be assessing them a little bit more yeah. closely. And also with consideration that although they might not be profoundly dehydrated now, the potential for them to become dehydrated, potentially the younger children, like the infants yeah, who um, might be borderline dehydrated at the moment, but if every time they take a feed they have a large you know, poo nappy, yeah. there's great potential for dehydration there. So I find that quite useful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we haven't got any um, questions on Twitter at the moment, so I think we'll move on to our next presentation.